Hi everyone, it's Beth from the HMH Agile Institute. Welcome back to our Agile YouTube series. Today we'll be talking with Dr. Bob Bailey about nudges. Hi Bob, welcome to the series. Hi, thanks for having me Beth. Maybe you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself before we get started. Sure. Uh, I practiced critical care medicine for over 25 years uh, and then moved on to administration, was a CMO, eventually as chief quality officer of the central region of HMH. Um, my plan was to retire in October, um, which I did, but one of my frustrations throughout my career was how long it took to get evidence-based practices really out to the frontline teams. You know, the literature says about 17 years, and I think that's what I, that's what I was seeing. Um, over, over my career, I read a lot of things. I read about complexity. I read about uh, behavioral economics, some of what we're going to talk about today about nudges. But I couldn't really figure out a way to put it all together. And then about, uh, I guess it's been almost two and a half years now, Jose Azar came to HMH as our chief quality officer and introduced me to Agile. And I really saw Agile as a way of putting, putting that all together in a way that we could actually speed up the, the rate of transformation at HMH. So rather than uh, completely retiring in October, I uh, elected to stay on as a consultant working with you and a few others to develop what we're calling the Agile Institute. And that's my story. Well, thanks so much and thanks for being here. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have worked with you over the past year in the development of our institute and prior when you were the central region CQO and I worked with you as the infection prevention director then. So. Thank you for everything you're doing, and we're really lucky that you decided not to fully retire. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> so I think nudge can tend to have a negative connotation out there. Historically, people might think it's an annoyance. You might ask my husband if he thinks I'm a nudge, always asking him to put away the dishes or pick up the clothes off the floor. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more through an agile lens what we mean by nudge. Sure. So. From the field of behavioral economics, the, the definition of a, a nudge is making a, a change or ar architecture, changing the architecture, um, either the social, physical, or digital environment in order to affect a change in one person's behavior or a group of people's behaviors. So that's, that's basically what it is, but still allowing them freedom of choice. So you, you don't take away uh, their ability to ch make a decision, but you help guide them in the direction that you know, you believe that they think they would like to go if they were really thinking about it. Thanks, Bob. If I could summarize, I would say then a nudge is a way that we can change through choice architecture, our physical, social, or digital environment to steer human behavior in a way that does not take away their autonomy. Yes, exactly. Great. Could you give me a few examples of nudges that you've worked through over the past year or so as we've learned a little bit more about agile science together? Well, I'll give you a couple examples that I think um, will be appealing to you as an infection control leader. Um, one would be a physical nudge, and that could be something as simple as where we place the soap containers, right? So the soap dispensers, so that they catch the eyes of people and remind people to use the, to use them. So that that's a very simple physical physical nudge. So a social nudge is where you, you know you can really change the behavior of a group and change a social norm. So if we could get where we'd like to get to, where you know most most of our team members were washing their hands, then for the team member who's maybe you know thinking twice about it, they will be influenced by seeing everybody else do it and be more likely to do it. Um, as far, I couldn't think of a digital nudge around hand washing per se, but there are so many digital nudges. Um, most people are familiar, at least in, in healthcare, with the digital nudges that are part of the uh, EMR. So here at HMH and EPIC, we have with the BPAs that constantly kind of remind people of something, guide people in a certain direction. Uh, and in our personal lives, I mean, every day you do something electronically, you know, you're, you're asked to, to make a choice. Um, but often uh, you notice the, there's something that's already pre-checked. And that's what we call a default nudge, right? So, uh, you know, you can change it, but they're, they're hoping that you're just going to check continue and continue what it, whatever was the, the setting that was set for. So um, default is actually one of the more powerful nudges, and it's, it's used both for good and, and not so good out there in, in the commercial world. But uh, you know, I think we can certainly use it uh, to achieve a lot of positive changes here at HMH. 
Thank you. I can think of so many as we're thinking through them. That default nudge, you always have to remove the check mark. Please do not send me texts and email alerts. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But it's defaulted there to send me that information. Great examples. Thank you. Can we talk a little bit more about behavioral economics and the science to support the use of nudges in healthcare specifically? Yeah, actually, the, the, there is, and you know, I was a little surprised. Like I said, as I was reading various um, books about this. Um, two of the great ones, uh, there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and there's another book that's actually called Nudge by Richard Thaler. Both of those individuals won Nobel Prizes, so uh, our, our, one of our mentors would say, yeah, that pretty, speaks pretty well to the, to the amount of good literature supporting something. Um, in in um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he talks about really um, two um, two states of being uh, that that our that our mind is you know uh, the first stage is the um, the way we work all, you know ninety percent over twenty three hours a day right and you know we don't we don't think about it, it it's it's unconscious um, we're guided by rules of thumb or called heuristics and it, it serves us it serves us pretty well. So, you know, when you drive to work every day, you're not thinking too much about, you know, you know how to get there. Um, you know, it, it, you don't have to spend a lot of extra um, mental energy, which our brain likes. The system two is the, the one where you really, and it's about less than an hour a day that we, we are in system two, because that really requires us to think. And we don't like to think because it requires additional energy. So, you know, if I say what's two plus two, You'll say four, right? Without even thinking about it. That's in system one. But if I say 260 times 580, then you're going to have to get your calculator out and actually and actually think about it. So that's really the difference between system one and system two. Um, and it's important to kind of understand that concept because in s system one with these heuristics, which, which work very well, but there's also it results in, in a lot of what we call biases. Right. So an example of a couple of biases, there's the confirmation bias. We tend to um, interpret things in, in terms of that we've um, the, the preconceived notions that we already have of how things could work. So we you know, interpret things in, in that context. Um, the status quo bias, I think everybody's kind of familiar with that. You know, it's much easier to just kind of go with the way you've always done something rather than to think about doing something differently. So there's the, all these biases out there, and they sometimes prevent us from making what we'd call a rational decision. Uh, so that's where there's a particular opportunity to use nudges uh, to try to prevent us from going down the wrong road and help us do, you know, do what we really would want to do if we were in system two and thinking about it. That's great. Thanks, Bob, for sharing that. I'll try to summarize again, remembering a nudge is a way that we change our physical, social, or digital environment through choice architecture to change or steer behavior of a very complex human without taking away their choice or autonomy. We talked about system one and system two. So we as humans think in either one of those ways, but we spend most of our time in system one, over 23 hours of the time, kind of just going with the flow and decisions that we make are based on heuristics, maybe from previous um, experience in our lives or just because it's the way we've always done things like that status quo bias you were talking about and nudges come into play as a way to try to hack that system one in a way right to make sure that we're making a rational decision you use the example of getting to work today and so many of us just hop in the car and all of a sudden we find ourselves parked and in the garage and walking in the door and Gosh, I don't know how I even got here, right? But before I got in the car and started the engine, once I hit the button to start the engine, we hear the beeping sound, right? So that could be a nudge to remind me I need to put my seatbelt on. I don't really think about it. I don't really even hear the beeping anymore, but I know the minute I get the car started, I have to put the seatbelt on so that way we can get to work safely. Exactly. And um, you mentioned that freedom of choice, Thaler in his book, uh, uses a term called libertarian paternalism. The libertarian part 
um, is you know a freedom of choice, freedom of will to make decisions. But the paternalism is the part where we try to guide people to actually do with what they would want to do if they were thinking about it. So I think that I have always found that that phrase resonates with me. The other thing I should add is, you know, this isn't a new. We, we all use nudges all the time, in, and in our personal life especially, right, with the sticky notes. I think, you know, I, I, I'm guessing most of us use sticky notes at one time or another to remind us to do things. Um, and, you know, I, I find uh, just as much as we're doing it at work with the Agile Institute, at home I'm using nudges. Like my wife even is, you know, familiar with the concept of the nudges, and we, we, we talk together about the best way because, you know, I'll, I'll say, um, you know, I didn't do that because I was in System 1, and she'll say, that's just an excuse, you know, come on. And I say, well, let's think, think of a good nudge so that next time it, it reminds me to do it, the, you know, the right way. Exactly. Great examples. Uh, we also talked about a recently published article about altering the physical environment in a patient room to encourage providers to sit and talk with their patients. Um, the article referenced just simply putting a chair by the patient's bed, really, and they monitored um, the time spent at the bedside and and the patient's impression or perception of that time spent with them, adding quality, you know, when you sit down and really spend the time with your patient. But to alter the physical environment was the simple nudge of just putting a chair there at the end of the bed. So nudges can be simple and it's helpful to think of them in that way as we're learning these concepts. They can be a bit more complex too, but I think thinking through them as good examples in our day-to-day lives helps us to better understand the concept. So thank you for sharing those examples. And we know that you're always good to share a few books with us as good references um, so maybe you could share one more time with the audience some of the books related to nudges and behavioral economics that you would recommend. Yeah, again, I'm going to just mention the same two because I, I think they are, um, again, both um, Nobel Prize winners. Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, yeah, it gets a little into the weeds at some point, but I think you know certainly the first half of the book I, I, is the, the most important in my mind. And then the second book, Nudge, um, by Richard Fowler, it's a little more practical and talks about you know how you can really create nudges in, in real life in order to change behavior. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us all about nudge and the science behind what it really is. It sounds like it's a little more than uh, me being a nudge to my husband or my six-year-old son, getting them to pick up their clothes, rather intentionally placing a hook perhaps mm-hmm. somewhere to get them to see that that's where the clothes should go as an example. So thank you again for spending the time. Um, For all of you out there who are looking to learn more about agile science, check us out on our YouTube series. Keep your eyes peeled for future episodes. Thank you everyone for listening in and we look forward to sprinting with you soon.